We monster fans often have disagreements about our favorite fright films, but there's one point on which nearly all of us agree, that Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is probably the best horror comedy ever made, just as fresh and funny today as when it was new. The timeless comic genius of Bud Abbott and Lou Costello has a lot to do with it, but so does the irresistible presence of our favorite universal monsters in their final appearance together. Lon Chaney as the Wolfman, Bela Lugosi as Dracula, and Glenn Strange as the Frankenstein monsters somehow managed to retain all the dignity befitting classic horror icons while lending their talents to some of the most hilarious set pieces to ever come out of Hollywood. Want to find out how it all happened? The story starts in 1948 at a little-known tourist attraction in La Mirada, Florida, McDougal's House of Horror. Count Dracula sleeps in this coffin, but rises every night at sunset. Chick is right. This is awful silly stuff. Although Abbott and Costello perfected the horror comedy in a popular series of films in the 1940s and 50s, humor had always been an important part of Universal's classic horror formula. <laughs> Masters of the genre, like director James Whale, always understood that laughing and screaming were just two sides of the same coin. Here we go gathering nuts and may, nuts and may, nuts and may. Here we go gathering nuts and may on a cold and frosty morning. Whoops! While Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein became one of the comedy team's best known and most loved films, Neither Bud or Lou ever anticipated careers having anything to do with monsters. Bud Abbott's family was in show business. They were uh, with the circus and later with burlesque. And at the time, burlesque was very clean. And that's the form of entertainment where you have strip teasers and comedians, basically, you know, the two things that really appeal to a male audience. He got into burlesque, and he was in burlesque over 20 years before he met and teamed up with Lou Costello. Now, Lou uh, was bitten by the show business bug, I think, from seeing Charlie Chaplin. Well, my dad actually came out to Hollywood the first time uh, back in the 20s. And he had his, his heart set on becoming a dramatic actor. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was his favorite. That was his idol. But I think he also saw in Chaplin the, the, the element of acting, not just the comedy. So when he came out here in 1925, I think it was, it was a hard road for him. He slept in parked cars. Um, you know, it was real hard to get the work. Lou found jobs as a studio construction worker and stuntman, but only occasionally as an actor. It was Dolores Costello, however, that told him to go back on the road, perfect his craft, and let Hollywood ask for him and then come back out. So he hitchhiked en route back to New Jersey and got as far as St. Joe, Missouri. Stranded in the Midwest, he took a job as a baggy pants comedian, work that kept him employed for several seasons. Then on the burlesque circuit in 1936, Lou Costello met Bud Abbott. I believe Bud had, had taken over for my dad's straight man who was sick one night. I guess chemistry was there and history was made. They are a classic combination that goes back to Greek comedy of a contrasting styles, the short, the tall, the thin, the fat, the smart, and the dumb. It's a combination that everybody can identify with and everybody kind of sees themselves in at some point and can laugh at. Plenty of people were laughing, and Bud and Lou soon took their famous burlesque routines to the airwaves. When Abbott and Costello moved into radio uh, on the Kate Smith show, they started running short of these classic uh, burlesque scenes that they knew so well, and they hired a fellow named John Grant, who was probably the best writer-producer in burlesque. One of their most celebrated routines involved a hilarious misunderstanding over the oddly named players of an imaginary baseball team. I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm about. not changing nobody. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. It was through the radio show and the airing of Who's on First that Hollywood did call for them, and that was universal. 
Can't blow a note unless a bass and guitar is playing with them. He makes the company jump when he plays Reveille. Among their first pictures at Universal was Buck Privates, one of the most successful wartime comedies ever. One, two, three, four. Bingo. Quiet. Well, I had it. Never mind that. Let's show around. Let's show around. Let's Why show don't around. you make up your mind? They became quickly the hottest box office in the country that year in 1941, and they made six films in 12 months. And in 1942, they were voted the number one movie stars in the world. And from then on, they were always at the top in the top 10 list of movie stars, uh, box office stars, and in terms of uh, highest salaried performers in show business as well. They were making probably about a million dollars a year, and this is in the war years. The team of Abbott and Costello was Universal's hottest commodity in the early 1940s. But the studio had another lucrative wartime franchise, Monsters. In 1942, while Bud and Lou were shooting on a nearby soundstage, Universal was conducting a strange experiment pairing two of its most popular monsters in one movie. Abbott and Costello took notice, but it wasn't a movie they had in mind. And Abbott and Costello had considered doing a Broadway show with the monsters, with Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula. And uh, this was uh, about 1943 or so. Um, Abbott and Costello were stage trained comics. They had come out of burlesque, they'd done Broadway, and they really missed uh, performing for a live audience. Unfortunately, they couldn't really spare the time uh, to devote to a Broadway show, and I think that logistically it would be very difficult with the makeup demands and things like that. So that idea was kicking around a lot for a while, and then finally in 1948, uh, the perennial question came up, what do we do next with Abbott and Costello? And their producer, Robert Arthur, uh, you know, said that why don't we team them up with the monsters? Although the concept was promising, the screenplay had some problems. Well, Lou Costello hated the script. He went into Robert Arthur's office, the producer, and he said, you're not serious about making this. My daughter could write something better than this. But as far as Universal was concerned, there was gold in them thar chills. And Bud and Lou had already demonstrated their flair for comedy thrillers that really performed at the box office. <laughs> Just a minute. Hold That Ghost was the first uh, scare comedy that they did, and it was such a big hit also, along with both privates, that they tried to work in scary scenes for Costello in just about every movie, because his scare take was just so great. The usual title of the film was The Brain of Frankenstein, and when the marketing department at Universal started hearing this title, they thought that it sounded like a straight horror picture. There was nothing to indicate it was a comedy. So Bill Getz, the uh, head of production, ordered a title test of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and that tested great with the public and the marketers because it said something funny and scary at the same time, which is what the film ultimately was. So who would be the monster promised by the title? After playing the creature in three Universal films, Boris Karloff put aside the role that had made his career. For the last two films, the boots and bolts were worn by an actor with a perfect name for the part, Glenn Strange. Well, Glenn Strange was a, a great character actor. You've seen him in thousands of westerns. Nobody ever knew his name, but he was always the bad guy because he was a big guy. He was six foot six. And when Jack Pierce was doing some of the work at Universal at that time, and they were going to do House of Frankenstein, and Karloff didn't want to play the monster anymore. It was one of these things that uh, he was doing Glenn, Pierce was doing Glenn, uh, in a pirate picture with Yvonne DiCarlo. He put a big scar in his face, and he kept looking at Glenn, and Glenn kept saying, every day he'd look at me, and he'd keep looking at me. And one day he said, will you stay over tonight? I'll pay you 25 bucks if you stay here. I might get you a good part in the movie. So he put paper up all over the mirrors so Glenn couldn't see what was going on and worked on him for about an hour. Glenn said he had no idea what he was doing. He said, he did a lot of stuff to my head. I know that. So they took the papers down. He saw himself and he goes, my God, I'm Boris Karloff. And Jack had always said the craggy face that Glenn had was kind of the face he had always thought about for this monster. Universal was eager to involve Boris Karloff in the Abbott and Costello film, but the original monster had serious reservations. I think Karloff thought that the film was going to make fun of the monster and he did not want any part in it. Also, he had retired from the role, so for him to come back, I think he was a, little, a lot older and I don't think it would have been as effective. 
but he did agree to publicize the film, and I think that was part of uh, his deal with Universal in terms of other film commitments. The part of Count Dracula would seem to have been tailor-made for Bela Lugosi, who originated the film role for Universal in 1931. There's this whole perception that Bela Lugosi played nothing in the movies at all other than Dracula. But really, even though he played other vampire characters or vampire type characters, he only played Dracula twice. And the second time, 17 years later, is Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. But the studio had other casting ideas. Well, one of the ironies about this uh, production is that Ian Keith was considered for the role of Dracula in this film. And back in 1931, he was the first choice of Universal to play Dracula in the original as well. The whole notion that someone other than Lugosi is Dracula in this film is almost inconceivable. And fortunately, of course, saner heads prevailed and Lugosi, again, after a long fight, just much like 1931, secured the part. The Wolfman was the only Universal monster portrayed by one actor and one actor alone, Lon Chaney. So there was no disagreement over who would play the part this time. But the transformation of Universal Studios into Universal International brought with it many disruptions with the past. Although the studio's head of makeup, Jack Pierce, was undeniably a genius, the combination of his cantankerous personality and the time-consuming nature of his makeup creations didn't sit well with Universal's new management. Despite 20 years of service, Pierce was still a salaried employee without a contract and was abruptly fired. He was replaced by one of his own assistants, Bud Westmore, a pioneer in the use of cost-saving materials like molded foam rubber. They required Westmore to come up with a new way of doing the monster's makeup to get the production uh, moving on time because they didn't really have like six hours to to spare on makeup. Now this is uh, Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman from Abbott Costello and Frankenstein. It's the nose piece goes down here. This is the forehead piece and they glued this on and, and it was more of a mask this time than the way Pierce did it because Pierce here did, did all the build up stuff and this was a lot more comfortable for Lon to wear because the whole rest of this was a mask actually. It came down over his upper lip and uh, they, they streamlined the makeup quite a bit. But here again, this was uh, quite a bit faster to do. It probably took about an hour to put this on, which I'm sure Lon Chaney Jr. was very thrilled about. The Frankenstein monster makeup had always been particularly time consuming. Westmore streamlined the process considerably. Now this is a very interesting piece. This is one of Glenn's actual headpieces from Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It's made of foam rubber and uh, it has incredible detail. Chris Mueller sculpted this, and uh, it's very old. It's from 1948. Nobody knows why it's lasted this long. Glenn had given this to me, and he had it in a closet in a paper sack for years. <laughs> Maybe that's the secret, put them in a paper sack, they'll last, I don't know. But the interesting thing about this, like with the clamps here, that nobody ever gets to see is, you can see they actually go into the head quite a bit which is something you never got to see in any of the movies whatsoever, which is kind of interesting. Jack Keevan applied this makeup to Glenn, and this took between an hour and an hour and a half to do, where Jack Pierce, when he did it with cotton and collodion and, and all the ways he did it with the wax and the putty, took maybe three to four hours to do. Now, one thing that uh, Glenn said was different about this and say, Pierce's makeup is this being foam rubber and all underneath here, uh, when he would sweat a lot during the day, uh, his sweat would build up in here. It had nowhere to go, and then when they would finally take this piece off, it would like rain down his face. The water would collect in here, and he'd have about a half a cup of water inside of this thing, where the cotton and clothing, of course, that Pierce did, it just absorbed, and it was different. But he, uh, he really preferred this makeup over Pierce's, and the kind of this was just much, much easier to get in and out of, for anything, and a lot more comfortable. Now here's a head of Glenn as the Frankenstein monster from Evan Costello and Frankenstein. Uh, this is one that I casted up years ago over at Don Post Studios. This is out of the original mold, and the reason they did a head like this in the film, in the end of the film you see Glenn walking down this, this pier and it's on fire and he ends up crashing and falling through the pier. Well, they didn't want to do a, an actor doing that, so they made a full-size dummy and had it rigged from over the top uh, on sort of a, a rig that would move with the dummy and hold the arms up, and they made a head up just like this to put on the dummy. And then they scooted the feet with boards. They had it on two-by-fours and scoot the feet, so you actually saw it walk, and then they had it actually, you saw the actual body fall through into the flames. Two of the favorite things in my collection are these monster boots you see behind me here. 
It's from Evan Costello Meet Frankenstein that Glenn Strange gave me years ago. He wore these boots when he and Bela did this midnight spook show after the film came out. And that's how he ended up with these. And they're great. They, they look very large and they are big. He was six foot six, a big man. And they're made out of felt. This is a felt material here. And it's actually out of crushed cork inside. So these aren't anywhere near as heavy as they look. They look very heavy, but they're not actually that heavy. Uh, there's actually a pair of his shoes inside here, if you could see inside. <laughs> so it was like slippers, so he could slip them on and they would fit him well. Otherwise, he'd just flop all over the place in there. And then these are actually made of wood, actually, the uh, bottom part of the boot. But they're really, really neat. And they're cool because they're Frankenstein monster's boots. You don't get any cooler than that. The script of Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, written by Frederick Rinaldo, Robert Lees, and John Grant, wasn't exactly a sequel to the earlier Universal films, where the various monster storylines had gotten, shall we say, a little out of hand. This time, the studio didn't even try to explain how the monsters returned. They were back to meet Abbott and Costello, and that was explanation enough. Abbott and Costello are two baggage handlers in uh, La Mirada, Florida, who, ex who get these two huge crates addressed to McDougal's House of Horrors. Now, for some reason, the beautiful Sandra Mornay is, has become Lou Costello's girlfriend. We don't know why. Eventually, we learn that she's become his girlfriend because she has picked out Costello's simple, pliable brain for transplant into the monster, because the monster has become, in Dracula's words, an unmanageable brute. This time the monster must have no will of his own, no fiendish intellect to oppose his master. There, my dear Count, I believe I have exceeded your fondest wishes. The new brain I've chosen for the monster is so simple, so pliable, he will obey you like a trained dog. Good. Now, Lon Chaney Jr., as the Wolfman, is on the trail of the coffin and the remains of Dracula and the monster. And he warns the boys that they would be receiving these crates and not to do anything with them. Nowadays, the Wolfman would probably have just cashed in and started a theme park. After all, where else in Florida do you find a castle like this? It's got great, great routines in it, but one of my favorites is at the Masquerade Ball. And it's my father and I think Bud and Lon Chaney Jr. And Lon Chaney is holding up the wolf's mask and says, when the moon is full, I turn into a wolf. And my father's line is, you and 20 million other guys. Great line, you know. The film included several well-established routines, slightly retooled to make room for monsters. Hold That Ghost inspired one of Meet Frankenstein's most memorable bits. The genesis, really, of Hold That Ghost was a bit that Abbott and Costello had called the moving candle gag, where uh, Costello is sitting in front of a table reading a map, and these two candles in front of him either slide back and forth or levitate. And, of course, when he calls Abbott in, Abbott never sees this going on. So that became actually a running bit, and in Meet Frankenstein, Costello always sees the monsters, and Abbott doesn't. This is kind of the same kind of routine, which worked very effectively in Hold That Ghost. Now, in Meet Frankenstein specifically, they took the, the moving candle bit and put it on Dracula's coffin. So when the coffin starts to open, the candle slides, and they do the bit again, but in a distinctly different uh, method. There's another scene where Costello mistakes the real Wolfman for Bud in the Wolfman mask. And of course, he pokes him, he pulls his nose and everything. And this was a standard Abbott and Costello bit that they had also done in the naughty 90s, where Abbott said, I'll put on a bear suit, I'll pretend to be a bear, and you'll wrestle me and impress people or, or scare people away. And of course, a real bear gets in, and Costello, unbeknownst to him, wrestles with a real bear. <laughs> The director of Meet Frankenstein was Charles Barton, a veteran Abbott and Costello collaborator. And they got along great, and uh, they were very good friends with Charlie, and they would do, they would try things with Charlie uh, that they wouldn't try with some of the other directors. Charlie Barton, to me, was probably one of the best of the Abbott and Costello directors. Uh, he knew how to handle them. He, he was the first one to initiate three cameras on them at all times to catch the reactions. He understood, I think, my dad in terms of um, where he might get a little difficult. Well, as uh, comedians who were, like I said, stage-bred comedians, um, they found it a little difficult to do the stop and start uh, momentum of the film. So they liked to keep things light uh, during the filming, and they would have these little practical jokes going on. They would have pie fights. They'd have little gags going on 
on the set just to keep the momentum going, to keep the, the mood light. You know, like a lot of film historians or comedy, his, comedy historians who like to say how unprofessional they were, you know, to go out there and be throwing pies and this and that. But try keeping the level of energy up in comedy when you're sitting there with a cut, okay, action, cut, action. It was their way of keeping their energy level up. I was a young boy, I think around 10 years old, when uh, Abbott and Costello Meet uh, Frankenstein was made. And I have very uh, vivid memories of being on that set. Uh, there was a lot of clowning around between takes. They, they actually hired people to come kid around. Uh, Abbott and Costello were always kidding around. The team's right-hand man in charge of cutting up was a professional clown named Bobby Barber. And he was a uh, bit player, and he's been in a lot of films actually in Hollywood, but his role on the Abbott and Costello films was really as a court jester. He kept things light on the set. He would come in and break up a take just to, just to get a laugh. He would, you know, throw pies, squirt salsa. He'd do, you know, ridiculous stunts just to get a laugh and keep Lou and Bud amused. One of the things that Bobby liked to do, and I believe is a scene where he comes in and interrupts them with Lon Chaney as well, um, but he does come down the steps following Dracula and interrupts the take. Now, the, the outtake cuts off very quickly, so you really don't know if Lugosi is going to turn around and deliver a punchline or he's going to start to really lay into Bobby. Glenn told me the story and did, did the Bela accent. Glenn with the southern accent was pretty funny. And he did something and, and Bela just looked at him and said, we should not be kidding when we are working. And then stormed off the set and that was it. Uh, a real professional, as far as his uh, takes were concerned, it was one take. He knew he had practiced his lines. I watched him practice. And when he got on camera, he did it perfectly. So anybody disturbing his scene, I think he did not appreciate. He did appreciate the seltzer bottles and the pie fights off camera, as long as he wasn't involved. He got a great kick out of it. And there's the scene where he's, Lou comes in and sits on the monster's lap in that dungeon. And they could, it took him forever to get through that scene because Costello would just start doing things while he's sitting on his lap, like hitting Glenn's hand, his own hand, and Glenn would start to laugh. <laughs> I can't help that story. And he'd just finally say, I can't get through the scene with this little guy. He just, he, he just won't be serious about this. I think I was a year old when uh, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein was being made. Story has it that um, my mother brought me onto the set. And Glenn Strange, who played Frankenstein, loved kids. And he saw me, and he moved towards me. I get completely done up with as Frankenstein. And... Um, my sister said that uh, you took one look at him and just screamed bloody murder to the point where I guess they had to get me off the set, you know, fast. I mean, that was it. Just broke down. Our affection for most comedians comes when we're little kids, when we see these guys, um, at least our, our generation, looking back with some sense of, uh, of history. Um, Lou is a little kid, and we really identify with his fear of monsters. I mean, children as young as three have watched Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein and have never really been scared to death, but they've, they've laughed a lot. It's when you can incorporate that comedy and slapstick into something that can be very, very frightening, especially to children. And all their films, I think, though, although geared for adults, boy, did they, they really bring in the kids. Children have always gravitated towards the classic monsters for a variety of reasons. You know, I think young people, for instance, like the Frankenstein monster because, like themselves, they're not sure of their place in the world and they're not sure of their own origins and their own powers. Oh. <laughs> Don't be afraid. He won't hurt you. And, you know, of course, the Wolfmen. There are all kinds of hormonal changes that we won't even talk about. And uh, Dracula really has always been about uh, the mysteries of sex and sexuality. I think young people instinctively graft on to the classic monsters for these reasons. Robert Lees, the screenwriter, said that one of his big theories was that comedy is rooted in fear. So when you have Abbott and Costello facing the monsters that probably have caused more nightmares than any other creatures ever created you know, in fiction, um, you really can't miss with the comedy there. 
The film certainly didn't miss at the box office. It was actually the second cheapest production by Universal that year, and it turned out to be their second biggest moneymaker that year. To capitalize on the success, Universal almost immediately cast Bud and Lou in a series of scary Abbott and Costello comedies, beginning with Abbott and Costello Meet the Killer, Boris Karloff. And Boris Karloff was really signed just to really bring the Frankenstein cachet into oh, this film. Oh uh, it's really a, a detective comedy, basically. It was written originally for Bob Hope and it was adapted for Abbott and Costello. And in fact, Karloff's character in the original screenplay was a woman. Maybe you'd like to select your own means of self-destruction. How would you like to die? Foliage. Bud and Lou's next Fright Fest picked up where Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein left off. Now that we've seen the last of Dracula, the Wolfman and the Monster, there's nobody to frighten us anymore. Oh, that's too bad. I was hoping to get in on the excitement. Who said that? Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the Invisible Man. <laughs> The new film was originally intended as another straight installment in Universal's popular Invisible Man series, but was rewritten to accommodate America's favorite pair of comedians. They, of course, added the Abbott and Costello routines to it, and it, and it kept evolving. And of course, the great scene in this is the boxing sequence, which uh, the Invisible Man is the third man in the ring with, uh, with Lou as the boxer, and then Lou's career as a boxer, you know, grows and grows because the Invisible Man's in the ring helping him. Next in line was another film with Boris Karloff, who had played many mad scientists before, but never Dr. Jekyll, not to mention Mr. Hyde. Uh, again, that's another film that has very few Abbott and Costello routines in it. It's a lot of uh, physical comedy. Bud and Lou whack each other over the head, and Bud takes pratfalls in it. Probably more in this one film than he did in all of their previous films. So there's very little uh, dialogue back and forth. And surprisingly, it was a huge hit. Have you seen a monster around here? No. Oh, I see you can't talk with that heavy mask on. Well, here, I'll help you take it off. You see, we're looking for him for a purpose. Now, there's a reason for... Ah! Ah! <laughs> as early as House of Frankenstein, Universal wanted to team up the mummy with its other classic monsters, but somehow it never worked out. So when it came time for Bud and Lou's final horror comedy, the mummy had to face them alone. Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy was their last picture at Universal, actually, and it is uh, really one of their funniest because this one uses a lot of the stock routines, but John Grant did these wonderful, clever switches on the routines and uh, really made them fresh again. By the 1950s, however, old-time burlesque was becoming less and less fashionable with audiences. I think my father started to see that the comedy was kind of coming to an end. Um, there was a change occurring, too. Uh, they were, you, you could start to see the trend was going more towards what would eventually be the Lenny Bruce comedy, you know, which would take it into a whole other realm. And my father never felt you had to be dirty to be funny. You know, and, and that was not the point of their comedy. Abbott and Costello were, you know, very much family men. They weren't uh, out uh, carousing at the nightclubs in Hollywood and things like that. But Abbott was married to his wife for 55 years when he died, and Lou Costello was married to his for 25 when he died. They were very decent men. They uh, supported their families. And, the, you know, the kids don't have any uh, mommy dearest stories to tell about these guys. They were really wonderful guys, and everybody who worked with them said the same thing. They were generous, they were fun to work with, and they were good guys. The comedy of Abbott and Costello will never die because of the access we have now to videos, the DVDs. I mean, it's timeless. It's universal long after we're gone. You know, there's going to be probably a small little microchip, you know, and you'll be able to watch it on your wristwatch or something, an Abbott and Costello film. My father loved electronics. He loved technology. If you put my father here today <laughs> with the DVD players and the video machines and the this and the that, I mean, he would have a field day. 
But to think of Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, it's kind of like you want to go back in time and you want to bring one of those flat little DVD cases and say, Dad, look at Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Can you believe it's right here? You know, that would, I think, freak him out. You say, I have to have one of those. Strangely enough, Abbott and Costello didn't care much for the film that immortalized them, at least in the eyes of monster fans. For many of us post-war monster boomers, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein was our introduction to the world of Universal Studios horror, a habit hard to kick. So, in appreciation of Universal monsters, Abbott and Costello and that swing band era where they all came together, let's take one last musical look at those boogie-woogie boogeymen. Thank you.